please. Uh, now presenting, we have Mark Kirby. He's going to be discussing repowering the site solar energy plant. Thank you all for coming out. Like you said, my name is Mark Kirby, and my platform is repowering the College of Integrated Science and Engineering Solar Energy Plant, which is located just out front of the ISAP building. And to, to give a bit of an introduction, um, if you were here for Chris's presentation, he talked about the development of renewable energy and how it's a growing industry. So I got an image from another site that Chris used, and it's quite common, the EIA. And this was from the 2008, and this is just the pro projection of the global installed power generation from each source. And you can see the green is hydro and other renewables, which includes wind, solar. And um, you can see that it's also, they're also projecting petroleum liquids to decrease. And you can see that also they projected the hydro and other renewables to surpass coal and all the other types. So it's, it's really important to focus on renewables to have programs that teach renewables. And through ISAT, we can do that because we have the energy concentration. And that really gives us a broad breadth of all renewable energies. Um, so my goals for this project, I have three main goals. The first goal was to examine other colleges and universities to see what they were doing in uh, terms of just renewables and primarily solar. So look in industries to just kind of just get a broad breadth and see what's out there and feel like my hands are a little dirty with it. And then my third goal was to actually weigh out potential options for the solar energy plant that's out front. And before we get into the, the actual plant, let me go over a little bit of terminology, um, which will be used throughout the presentation. So this, as you can see, is a schematic of a solar cell, which is the smallest unit, to a solar panel or module, and then to an array. So one cell makes up, many cells make up a panel, many panels make up an array. And there'll be times I'll be referring to the arrays out front as racks because they're supported on stationary racks. So kind of just remember this. So small array. Yeah. Um, so now we have that. So now we can talk about the science and history of photovoltaics because before we even talk about it, we gotta know what we're talking about. So to start off, the photovoltaic effect, which is the creation of voltage or electrical current in a material upon its exposure to light. And without that effect, the solar panels wouldn't be a thing. Um, and this was first observed in 1839 um, by a French uh, physicist, um, what was his name? Kirk Riddle, his name. And um, we'll talk about it later about more of the scientists more prominent. But then also the semiconductor physics behind it, why it works, how it works. So the main element found in so PV is silicon. And that's because silicon has an unbound balanced electron. And when the silicon is in a solid state, um, the energy levels are kind of smeared, and like leveled. Um, and then they, they create subbands. So then there's, there's several subbands, but the second subband is called the conduction band. And it's empty when it's at the ground state. And the spaces between the band regions where no energy levels exist and no electrons is known as the band gap. And um, so, so as I'm talking, this is a, a cutout of a, if you take like a cell, and that's just kind of just the levels of it. So the, then now we have the P and N, um, P and N um, semiconductors, which P, P type is usually, that yeah, p-type is um, usually aluminum because it's an acceptor of an electron, and the p-type is usually a, a, something like phosphorus because it has an extra electron, so it's a donor. Um, and that's important because since an electron is negative, and a hole is created when um, yeah, so when a photon hits a solar panel um, with significant energy, it actually pushes the like pushes a piece of the silicon electron and imparts energy, so it moves across that gap, and that's what creates the current, and it's in um, DC. So now, you have the general, that was a very brief introduction to the semiconductor physics. You could do a whole presentation just on that. I just kind of give you guys a little breath into it. So now, early solar cells, was actually an offshoot of a, a resistor project at the Bell Telephone Laboratories 
Um, and the, the three scientists that um, Kappen, Ford, and Pearson, they were credited with the creation of the first blue new cell. It was about 6% efficient. Um, and then later, the, the three were out to be contracted for NASA for developing their PV on their first permanent satellite. So I, I just use the word first photovoltaic cell. So what is a photovoltaic cell? It's like going back to that diagram, it's that first little square. So now with the photovoltaic cell, it's an electrical device that converts energy from light directly into electricity, but it converts it into direct current, not AC, so we can't. This, the steps that need to be taken to have it be usable. And there's also different types of photovoltaics. There's monocrystalline, polycrystalline, and thin film. Um, monocrystalline, um, pretty much is just large. I, once silicon is manufactured, it's just kind of the slices of it, just kind of one, not too many, th not too much combined in it. Polycrystalline is a combination of multiple elements. Um, and thin film is like almost like spray on solar in a way, um, which I was like researching and it's kind of like weird. But they kind of spray it on like glass to use and then they connect all the wiring. And the manufacturing of this is actually quite um, environment intensive as well as energy intensive because it's silicon and it has to be mined because it's, it's, it's a natural element. And then it's melt, uh, this is just a general um, manufacturer one I found from a company. And they melt it at 1,000 degrees Celsius, they cool it in crystalline shapes, they remelt it with additives um, to like, improve their efficiencies. They cool, they cool with the unit to a solid shape, so it's either a cube or cylinders, depending on what um, shape they want the panels to be, uh, cells. Um, and then they cut those into wafers, separate those, wash them, put more chemicals on them, and then from there, it's hand separated to a machine, which then um, assembles the rest of the panel. So now that we have the background, how it's done, what it is, what are, like what's being done here in Virginia? And the schools I chose to look at um, are kind of local schools to compare. Um, and through this comparison, I used the um, ASHE STARS program. ASHE is the Association for the Advancement of Sustainability in Higher Education. And the STARS program is sustain Sustainability Tracking Assessment and Rating Systems. And it's all self-reporting. Um, so each of these schools that, um, it's, all, it's nationwide all throughout the United States, and there's actually some also international. Um, but it's reporting, and each school has a person of contact that reports about every year, and some schools it's every other year, it just kind of depends, and some schools don't report at all. But it's not just renewables, they also deal with composting, and um, rainfall, wastewater. <coughs> they also had a, for my project, renewable energy, so. Um, these are the universities that are local. Um, UVA, Washington Lee, JMU, and Virginia Tech. UVA has added a lot of solar, and they also lease 364 <coughs> kilowatt system on top of their library, one of their libraries, I believe. Um, Washington Lee has two systems, and they're about to add a third to hopefully um, power all the upperclassmen dorms. JMU, we only have a 10 kilowatt system, but we use it as a teaching tool but it does also give us energy as well. And Virginia Tech has um, a unit that they just recently put on top of their parking garage. That's a 102 kilowatt system. So here's the UVA site, and this is um, through Dominion, as um, here the sound energy in the panels are with. This is the Washington and Lee site, and this square on the top right is actually where they're proposing to add the new solar facility to power the um, upperclassmen dorms. And they wanted to have it away from the main campus and away from interactions to preserve the campus natural beauty. And that little second red square is where the staging area was where the track and field is. Um, and they also have one or two other units, but um, the ones installed are lower on, on campus that aren't in this image. This, the JMU facility right out front, you can actually have done a presentation if you want to see it, you should go to that window. <laughs> <laughs> this is the Virginia Tech system, and like I said, it's on top of the park garage, and it does provide shading to cars too, so park on the top is an RG and the cars in the Asana. So those are just the schools locally that I wanted to show. 
And here's the ranking of them. I made this um, Excel sheet based on the ASHI data. And you can see, I mean, I also did other schools, um, more, more east of us and south and just all around. But out of these 10 schools I did, JMU is ranked fifth out of six for energy produced and we are third for energy consumed. Washington Lee is first with energy produced, and, U and uh, UVA is first in energy consumed. But this data is a little off because each of these, um, each of these ratings um, comes from a different year, and also UVA just installed another um, system not too long ago, and Washington Lee is also that proposed system. So this chart will change. So the photovoltaic industry, there's a lot of manufacturers, there's a lot of installers. Um, here just to the list of some local installers as well as um, some big installers like Solar City is a Tesla owned company. Segura is out based out near Charlottesville. And some manufacturers of solar panels. Uh, some of these are um, United States based, others, most of these are actually foreign based. And when we're talking about PV projects, there's two scales. There's small scale and large scale. Small scale is the, the house unit, the one, like, small stuff. Like, my watch, it's an eco drive. It has a PV panel in it. Like, calculators with the four functions with the little black band, that's a PV panel, essentially. Um, and then there's large scale projects that are hundreds and thousands of panels. Um, and the largest one is actually in India that just overtook one in the United States and it's a <coughs> 648 megawatt system. And India is attempting to, uh, trying to I think it was like 30% renewable by 2025 or 2030. I was doing some reading on it the other night because it came up because it was recommended searches as I was finishing my project. So now we're talking about the other facilities. What the, so now let's talk about the JME facility. What we currently, it's right outside. BP Solar, Millennium Solar X panels is what we have. Um, there's a combiner box, inverters, transformers, and I'm actually gonna walk you through what we have there now. So to start off, from the panels, it goes inside to the junction box, but then it goes to the junction box on the left, um, where it's just all the wires come together. And then it goes up to those two Xantrex um, combiner boxes that have a max voltage of 600 voltage DC and 15 amps. And then from there, here's another image of the combiner box with the inside view of them. And then it goes to um, uh, a disconnect. Um, from the disconnect, it goes to the inverter. And the inverter converts the DC to the AC. So, that, so the input is 330 voltage DC minimum, and it outputs a 208 voltage of AC. Um, and of course it fluctuates what it's actually getting in and out due to the fact that it's, it's solar. Um, since on a cloudy day, it's not gonna produce as much energy. On a nice bright day, it's gonna be running at full force. And from the inverter, of course it goes to another disconnect, from the disconnect, it then goes to a transformer that steps up the um, AC current from 208 to 480. So from the um, transformer, it goes to another junction box, to another disconnect, and then from the disconnect, then it goes inside to the JMU basement. So that was a lot. So if you were inside the solar building, this is the, essentially the wall and the red arrows are the flow of electricity, so it's a little road map. So now, the proposed site plan. Since JMU is a teaching facility, I want to have a couple of different options we could do. Of course, each of them are different prices. Option one I want is the ideal option, which I think would be the most beneficial to students learning, is to install two to three new panel types, and the ones I selected for this would be the uh, three panels, one from solar board, one from sun power, and one from burst solar, but I'll talk about those in a second. New racks, of course, to support and hold those panels. And of course, you have to make sure the electrical, electrical equipment is in place, or we can somehow make sure, like, um, because so, some panels, when you buy them new, a lot of them come with microinverters already attached on them, so they're already converting the DC to the AC. 
then the, you, we don't even need the inverter in that case. We just need a combiner and transform, transformer. So there's that option, but that's again with three different panel types because I want three different types because it will give students, you know, like we could visually see three different types of panels and you can kind of tell from the readings out like which one's better and like, to, like actually compare them. New racks, I even thought of a new rack that was actually adjustable so you could adjust it. Um, I really didn't do too much research into that because um, we just were learning about it in 410, learning about angling. Um, my second option would be one or two panels, um, which would be the solar ward and the sun power one, and I'll explain why I chose those in a second. Um, retrofitting the current racks, because the, at, the, at the point right now, they're angle right where there's no shading of other panels throughout the day and the year. So it'd be a good, um, it'd be a good fit, just to kind of just adjust what we have now, save a little money. And then, of course, make sure you have the proper electrical equipment. Or option three, there's a couple panels that have had rocks thrown at them. Just replace those. So, like I said before about the microinverters for potential equipment, when I was looking at these companies in the spec sheets, there was a lot, um, and there was different options. None of them had price points, but um, a lot of them had, some had microinverters, some did not. Um, some came with uh, frames, some did not. Some came with everything. Um, but these are the three panels I mentioned, the Solar Ward SWA 2, 285, the Sun Power P17, and the first Solar Series 3. And I chose these three panels um, because I, after I made um, all the spec sheets, I made a figure to compare them. And I chose the Solar Ward and the Sun Power to be the ones that are definitely have because they're about the same surface area. Um, <coughs> They're about the similar in rating, um, but I mean they're close. But at the same time, it's like you can't have two panels from different companies be the exact same. That just work too well. And then the first solar one is interesting <coughs> because it's it's like bands. It's not really just a solar cell. It's like three bands. So I thought that'd be interesting to see. But it's also a lot smaller. Um, than the other ones, so that's why I chose to have the solar ward and the sun power be the t like two to three, or definitely the two to change, because they're kind of similar. So that was that on it. Um, some references I have. Um, I got a lot of my information from the EIA, um, IEA, um, and a lot of but also my information just came from just the university's websites, and I also made a few phone calls to. Um, like one or two that were willing to talk to me, and that's how I also got some of my information. And um, that's my presentation. Does anybody have any questions? Can you connect with, connect with student organizations at those other universities that are going to do with solar power? With other universities? Yeah. Well, did you, you, just, you said you made some phone calls. I was asking, mm -hmm. did you make contact with other student organizations? Uh, no student organizations. Um, no, I just got phone calls to facilities, or I call it a, a UVA. I call it um, one of the departments, and they just like, transfer me to another department. And um, I have his name written down somewhere. Um, and he just kind of just told me what was, what was going on with them. Uh, for the solar cell we have outside, uh, were there original projections? Or was it a student-run uh, project when they were yeah, installed? Yeah, um, it originally started in 2002, I believe, with Kurt Morgan. Installed? Oh, installed? They, oh, they were installed in 2003. Yeah, I think Kurt's project started in 2002, I believe. Actually, three, three? three consecutive capstone projects from 1999, I think, to 2003 that uh, led that to that. the final design yeah. and, and construction. Yeah, I'm um, actually at the building since it is a teaching tool. If you go down to it in the window, it actually has a nice little um, information blurb about it. And it was, a, and it was, a, it was installed in the early 2000s, like Dr. Miles said, the capstone started sooner than that. And also, all of, uh, was there original like, projections as to how much uh, kilowatt hours would produce in a year? Um, for the new system, no, because it depends on which ones we get. I know out there it's a 10 kilowatt system. Um, yeah, I mean, this just kind of depends on what JMU, like, ISAP wants to do with it. 
right. So I'm hoping the project will get picked up by another student in the future because I kind of like laid the groundwork and have someone else step in like, okay, now let's actually do it. Yep. Is it possible for us to use all of the supports that are already installed? It just seems to me like that the original project probably did a lot of work to position them properly yeah, that's to get the I right think. angles. <laughs> that's your that's your option two, right? Um, option two is so to retrofit, yeah. To maintain the, yeah. the infrastructure that's out there. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. And about how much <clears throat> do you think that would cost for JMU to... I had a, like that. I had trouble actually getting in contact with people that would give me prices. So I, I had a lot of people that call, I called, and they said, um, we'll, we'll go through facilities. But okay. some, I was a student going through JMU, and, that, and they said, well, we can't really give you a price because it's JMU's facility. So they said, JMU would have to contact us. Yeah, that's, that's the one phase of this project that is to be completed. Yeah. Is to get some cost estimations for each of those three. We're trying. Scenarios. Okay. <laughs> we so get a guy now. That the solar panels are used as a teaching tool. Yes. Um, I guess they're on East Campus because we have the science um, department over here. Do you think there'd be any benefits to putting any on Main Campus? Well, they're, they're put here because JMU said we can put them there. Um, because you don't want to. JMU. I was, I was talking to Dr. Miles a couple of meetings ago. Why we can't have some on the rooftops is because Jamie doesn't want to lose new roof warranties. And plus, if we put on like on the bluestone buildings, those roofs are a lot different than like the newer roofs we have today. Um, but just kind of putting them like on the ground somewhere, there's no really good positions over there um, that I could foresee. Plus, you could see them from Route 81, so yeah. a lot of people get to see that we have those panels. Yeah, where they are now. Mm -hmm. But yeah, sure, sure, another, I'd add to that, that there are opportunities to bring solar across the entire campus. There's uh, roofs of parking decks, there are rooftops. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have an enormous amount of open space that would probably be used for that purpose, but we do have a lot of roofs and we have parking. So I think that there's the opportunity there if the university wants to proceed with it. Yeah, I was wondering, um, what what the concept was. Were you proposing putting like a string of uh, one panel type, a string well, of a second panel so type, there's a string of 15 a third? racks of 15 panels. So when I proposed the two to three, so there'd be three, so it'd be five, five, and five. And then if there's just two, we can just do half and half, like, well, not half and half because it's odd number. But so that's how I would, that's how I was foreseeing it. Okay, and were yeah. you contemplating using micro inverters or three separate inverters for you guys uh, and inverter? For See, each that, that would just depend overall what Jamie wants to do and which panels we end up getting in the end. Um, micro inverters would be probably the easiest, in my opinion, because um, how small the system is, not that large. Um, but if we can have it all just kind of just run to one inverter, I mean, that's simple, easy wiring, relatively. Somebody knows it. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, I have choice in waiting. Okay. Okay. Um, I had heard that those panels might have been turned off from HAC's uh, recommendation. Is that true? Or no? That room has been floating around here for 10 years. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> that, that, that system's been there 15 years. It, it shut down. It was shut down for several months. I'm going to say seven, eight years ago because the inverter failed and mm -hmm. needed to be replaced or needed to be repaired we but no, otherwise it's been pretty much continuous yeah. we need to do a fundraiser to put a sign on the building that says i am working <laughs> <laughs> right, i think i have time for one more question but, yeah. i just wondered if the efficiency of the panels has decayed over time um these panels so generally last about 20 years it was a lifespan that is a very good I personally did not do any research into that, but I mean, just knowing from class-based knowledge that they do decay, and then they've been out there 10, 10, 10 15 years, years now, years. So 15 years, so. So it's about time. So they're, they're, they're about toward, towards the end, but it's about, like, I'd say 15, 20 years lifespan. The Smithsonian, ah, the Smithsonian has called and asked for those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're ready to be replaced. Yeah. Uh, well, that's all the time I have, so. Yeah.